Uh, Chi or Erica, do you want to start? Yes. Okay. Okay, now that the numbers stabilize a bit, I think we're going to get started. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Chi Lin, and I'm a grad student at Yale. Um, thank you all for joining us today for the Innovators in Cognitive Neuroscience Speaker Series. Before starting, um, we first want to... Oh, I should send this to everyone. Um, before getting started, um, I just want to make sure to acknowledge the ind indigenous lens from which we're joining today's talk. So um, I'm speaking to you from New Haven, Connecticut, um, lay taken from, land taken from three indigenous peoples, uh, Krinipiak, Paguset, and Wappinger. And please use the link I just sent to the chat to research and re reflect on the indigenous lens from which you're joining us from. Through the acknowledgement of past harms, we step towards more equitable and humane futures. On behalf of all the students and postdocs on the organizing committee, I am excited to welcome you all to today's Innovators in Cognitive Neuroscience Seminar. The organizing committee together represents a consortium of colleges and universities, including Dartmouth, UPenn, Yale, MIT, Princeton, Harvard, Columbia, and Gallaudet. They are committed to highlighting advances in cognitive neuroscience research. We acknowledge the privilege of these institutions, and we wish to make the science discussed here available and accessible far beyond the ivory tower of academia. So with the consent of our speakers, we plan to make this talks publicly available on our website and our seminars open to anyone who's interested. And a quick note to those who are new to the series, after this talk is over, we will move over to a new Zoom room for the Q&A. This is a space for anyone to ask additional questions that were not answered during the talk and or any questions about Odette's career as a scientist. And I will post the link to the Q&A right now. Um, and then I'll post the link again at the end of the talk so that people can move over. And with that, I will hand it over to Erica to introduce our speaker today. Thanks, Chi. Hi, everyone. My name is Erica Bush, and I'm a graduate student at Yale University as well. Thank you for joining us for today's seminar given by Oded Vine, a postdoctoral researcher at Princeton University. I'm really excited to introduce Oded. Oded completed his bachelor's and master's degrees at Hebrew University in Jerusalem and his PhD at NYU Psychology with Lila Devachi. Oded's research focuses on understanding knowledge organization in the mind and brain, with a particular focus on how this is impaired in mental illness. Today, he's going to present his work titled Organized Knowledge for Learning, Memory, and Decision Making. So let's all welcome Oded. Um, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. Let me just share my uh, slides. Oops, sorry. All right. Um, can you all now see my slides and, oops, sorry. Can you all see my slides and you don't see like uh, my notes? Yep, you're good. Okay, great. Um, all right, so I want to thank Erica for this introduction and thank the organizers as well. I'm very excited um, to be here today. Um, and I'm speaking with you um, today from Brooklyn, uh, which is um, used to be the land of the uh, Mansi Lenape, a subtribe of the Lenape. Um, and the organization that I wanna to highlight today is um, Community Access. Community Access provides housing, social support, and advocacy for individuals with mental health concerns. And they're doing a lot of important and wonderful work. So uh, please check them out. Um, and moving to my research, um, I just wanna see if, uh, yeah, cool. Um, so I just want to make sure you see just a black screen now, right? You don't see my notes. Correct. Correct. You're Correct. good. Okay, great. So moving to my research, the starting point for all of my research is that 
as we process information coming from the external world, we never process it um, tabula rasa, like this empty brain. But we approach the world with our already existing knowledge. And this knowledge allows us to make context appropriate predictions and guide our behavior. So as I go out to the street, knowing that I'm in New York City, I already expect taxis to be yellow. And that can help me to decide to raise my hand and catch a car. And I won't just be waving aimlessly towards random yellow cars. So at any point, adaptive behavior results from an interaction between the external world and our internal knowledge. And in my research, I break this interaction to two main questions. The first is how do we learn and organize our knowledge of the repeated and predictable structure of the world? That is the knowledge that in New York City, taxes are yellow. But to be adaptive, a learning system also needs to know how to update this knowledge. For example, if input from the external environment is different than what we predicted, and we need to update our internal model of the world. So the, the second question that I'll ask is, how do we update our knowledge? And in the brain, the cortex was traditionally thought to represent our knowledge about the structure of the world, our semantics or schemas. However, in recent decades, there is a growing appreciation of how the hippocampus also contributes to learning structure. And even more specifically, how different subregions in the hippocampus, so this schematic is, is like a slice of the hippocampus, and I'll say more about these subregions later, but we now appreciate more how these subregions contribute both to learning the structure of the world and to memory update. And naturally, the hippocampus does not work alone, but also interacts with the cortex during learning. So this is a medial view of the brain. And one key cortical region is the medial orbitofrontal cortex, medial OFC, a region in the prefrontal cortex critical to representing the structure of the world and using this knowledge to guide decisions. So I'm going to look at this region, but not only the medial part, um, the lateral prefrontal cortex is also important for learning. So in the talk today, I look at the brain, both in the level of hippocampal subfields and hippocampal prefrontal interactions to address um, these two questions that you see here. So just to give a little roadmap for today, in the first part, I'll start by asking, how do we represent well-learned events based on context and time? And then I'll ask what happens when this context is partially unobserved? Then in the second part, I'll ask, how do we update our knowledge when the environment does not match our predictions? as well as other cases of knowledge updating. For example, just adding a new piece of information to existing knowledge. All right, let's start with the first question. To illustrate what I mean by the structure of the world, let me tell you about my morning routine. So when I commute to Princeton from my home in Brooklyn, I get on the subway uh, in the morning and then I get off and grab coffee and I sit um, for a little bit in Bryant Park before I get on the train to Princeton. And this happens many times a week, so that eventually, um, through repetition, I develop a representation of this sequence of events, the structure of my morning routine. And these events are not all smooshed together, they unfold in time, and they are organized based on context. I get out of the subway and enter the coffee shop, and likewise, between the coffee shop and um, the park, there is a change of context. And these changes of context are called event boundaries. So events unfold in time and they're separated by boundaries. And also within each event, there is a sequence of occurrences that unfolds in time. For example, in the coffee shop event, I first order the coffee and then I pay uh, and then get my coffee and leave. And this sequence of occurrences is thought to be integrated together into one event representation of the coffee shop event. And then at the boundary, this event representation ends and we start a new event. For example, of being in the park in which I typically read a bit from my news and then call a friend. Empirical evidence for this notion comes from many paradigms. I'll just mention a couple that are relevant for today. So for example, in this study, participants saw a list of objects superimposed on color backgrounds. So here a switch of color marks uh, a shift of context or a boundary. And even though participants were doing the same, reaction times for the first item in the event, the boundary item, were slower. 
which was interpreted as some cost to the boundary, potentially the need to um, end one event and start a new event representation. So boundaries take longer to process. Um, and also in memory, we remember better the order of things when they happen in the same event compared to two different events, suggesting that events are chunked in memory. So this has been shown for novel events, for things that we experience once. But our daily routine is very well learned. We experience the same thing again and again and again. So what happens to events with learning? I would suggest that learning poses attention on event segmentation, because with more learning, there is more opportunity to link things and integrate events in memory. So events can get over integrated and also within event, um, details can get all jumbled in memory. And this can lead to the loss of contextually relevant knowledge and to specific loss of specific event details. So the question is, how do we keep well-learned events organized? How do we integrate what is needed, but also separate and keep things in order? One possibility is that integration and separation processes in hippocampal subregions keep our events organized. So as a whole, we know the hippocampus is implicated in event segmentation, hippocampal activity increases at event boundaries, and hippocampal neural representations were shown to mediate memory for temporally extended events in both humans and in rodents. However, how CA3 um, and Dante Gyrus, DG, two different subregions of the hippocampus, um, that are thought to mediate integration and separation, how each may integrate or separate information to organize events is unknown, and especially through learning. So let me tell you a little bit about CA3 and DG. CA3 neurons are highly interconnected between themselves, and this was previously suggested to promote attractor dynamics. Similar inputs might converge or pattern complete to the same activity pattern, and this may promote integration, whereas different inputs might attract CA3 activation to different patterns. So one possibility is that CA3 attractor dynamics may integrate representations within the same event because they are similar, they share the same context, but separate between different events. DG, on the other hand, is thought to support pattern separation. DG neurons fire very sparsely, and this is thought to promote the allocation of distinct representations to similar stimuli. So one possibility is that layered on CA3 integrated event representations, DG pattern separations support distinct representations of things that happen in each event or of event details. And to address these questions, we had people learn repeating events. Participants saw these black and white objects superimposed um, on color backgrounds presented sequentially like the study I showed you before. And critically, every four objects, we changed the background color, effectively creating different events. So here you see two events, each list had six of them. Then we simply repeated each list five times, identical repetition. Participants saw the entire list of six events and then immediately saw exactly the same list again and again and again, five times. We then look at the neural representations of these items in CA3 and DG, and in human fMRI, neural representations are the multivoxel activity patterns. We have this multivoxel activity pattern per each item, as participant per each item, as participants were learning the list. And I remind you, we wanted to ask how do CA3 and DG integrate or separate information based on shared context um, and as events unfold in time. So to do that, we calculate how similar are the representation of these items. And so we look at similarity between items that immediately followed each other or zero temporal gap, and also items that were farther apart in time. And we could also do it based on context or event. So here, all of these orange ones that you see here are belong to the same event. They appear in the same background context. But in gray, we also calculated similarity between items across two different events. And if CA3 uh, indeed integrates information based on events, then we expect that all of the items within the same event will be represented more similarly than, I than items that appeared across different events and potentially irrespective of temporal gap. 
So here you're going to see similarity values focusing on the fifth repetition when lists are well learned, subtracting the first presentation to control for similarity due to characteristics of the bold signal. And temporal gap is on the X axis. And indeed the similarity between items that appeared in the same event here in orange was higher than the similarity um, of items that appeared in different events in gray. And this is irrespective of temporal gap, suggesting that CA3 chunk representations based on events. And for the interest of time, I'm not going to show you, but this pattern is not strongly there in the second repetition, it emerges with learning. And when I turn to DG, as I mentioned, DG Dante Gyrus is thought to support pattern separation to allocate distinct representations to similar stimuli. And this has been shown for perceptually similar information. However, we still don't know whether DG pattern separates also things that are close in time and might share similar temporal information and whether temporal pattern separation is modulated by context. So we took the same approach as we did for CA3. And again, we focused on the fifth repetition and to orient you, lower similarity values means more um, separated, less similar. And you can see here that within event in orange, Items that are closest in time that had no temporal gap between them and likely share the most similar temporal information are the most differentiated compared to items that are farther in time, gaps of one and two. And across events in gray, we don't see this. So items that do not share the same context are all pretty much the same in Dante Gyrus. Across events, the context, in this case, the background color changes. So that likely inputs are already different enough in their cortical representations and DG doesn't need to kick in and perform pattern separation. So DG pattern separation may facilitate distinct representation of event details, that those that are the most similar in time and in context. And I'm not going to show it, but we see nothing in the second repetition. The effect emerges with learning. We also simulated a simple computational model, suggesting that inhibition that gradually decays may underlie this result. I'm happy to talk about it later. Okay, so I showed you evidence that well-learned events are segmented, suggesting that segmentation is not merely a result of novelty and that learning refines the representation of events, makes events more, chunks, more chunked in CA3 and event details more distinct in DG. So in this study, the context was fully observed, orange or purple background, like in my morning routine, the subway, the coffee shop, and the park. But in our daily life, sometimes the appropriate cortex context is not fully observed. So going back to the coffee shop that I usually go to, typically they don't have good croissants on Friday. I have no idea why. Maybe they just don't bother to bring new ones before the weekend, not sure. Anyway, the information of what day it is, is not easily observed. Nothing in the coffee shop tells me what day it is. I need to retrieve this information from memory to know if I should order a croissant or something else. So next I wanted to ask, how do we learn this type of partially unobserved context representations that is many times needed to guide decisions? And in the computational framework of reinforcement learning, such context representation, the information we need to reach a decision is termed state. And a test can be thought of as a sequence of such states, like the task of ordering a croissant can be a sequence of entering the coffee shop, retrieving, it's not Friday today, spelling out the order, paying, et cetera. Uh, and in this case, that in the case that states are partially unobserved, there are theoretical frameworks and um, empirical evidence as well that implicate the medial OFC, which is highly connected with the hippocampus in representing a map of such states. So in this study, I focused on the medial OFC to ask, does the state representation evolve in the medial OFC with learning? We had participants perform a task in which some information about the state is not observed, but is based on the previous trials. And on each trial, participants saw an image um, of a superimposed house and a face and had to judge whether either the house or the face is old or young. The information of which category to judge was dependent on the previous trials. So as long as the age is the same, participants should continue judging the same category. And in this sequence of trials, participants should start by uh, judging faces as young, 
Then there is a change of age. So in this trial, um, it's a trial of an old face. And participants who then switch a category so that in the next trial, they start judging the houses. And one way to represent this task is using the category and the age of the current trial and the previous trial, which all of the combinations together create a map of 16 states. So we are going to look at these 16 states representation in OFC. And we can look at how this representation emerges because we had participants performing this task in two days in the scanner. So we could track learning. And in behavior, here you see error rate. It looks the same in reaction time. Participants learn, they get better. And in the brain, we train a classifier on multivoxel activity pattern to classify the 16 states. So first, only on day two, when states were very well learned, we can decode 16 states above chance in the medial OFC. And this replicates a previous finding with a very similar task. But will we see a refinement of this representation as participants learn the task? To ask that, we trained the classifier on the representations of day two and tested separately on each run of day one. And you can see here that as runs proceed on the x-axis and participants learn the task, we see higher decoding of the 16 states in OFC. This suggests that learning refines the representation of states in the medial OFC. Okay, so, so far I asked, how do we learn and organize uh, our knowledge of uh, the structure of the world. And first, I looked at integration and separation processes to ask how event representations are organized based on context and time. I found that learning facilitated chunking of events in CA3 while increasing CA, uh, DG separation of event details. And in the second study, I asked what happens as partially unobserved contexts are learned and found that learning refined OFC representations when the context is partially unobserved. So this gives us two examples of how learning refines context representations in these key systems of the hippocampus and the medial OFC and how they learn and organize our knowledge of the world. And having such organized context appropriate representation is adaptive because it allows us to make good predictions about what is going to happen in each context. So for example, when I go down the subway, I already know it will be packed. I know it will most likely be dirty. And I know that even if I have to wait a bit, eventually the train will come. But what happens when our environment changes and then does not match our predictions? How do we update our knowledge? So one day I'm about to step into the subway expecting to find a dirty car, but instead of a dirty car, I actually step into a shiny, clear, uh, clean car. And this is an mnemonic prediction error. The idea is that I expected one thing based on my memory, but the actual experience was very different. And in this case, it is adaptive to update our memories in order to make better predictions in the future. But how can memory update happen? One way to update our memory is by upregulating and coding off the new information, like the clean subway, while downregulating retrieval or processing of our incorrect memory based predictions. The hippocampus is known to be important for both encoding the laying down of new memories and retrieval of old memories, potentially in different pathways. Retrieval of memory based predictions is thought to be projected from region CA3 to region CA1. As I mentioned, CA3 neurons are highly interconnected between themselves, and this is thought to facilitate pattern completion through the same attractor dynamics mechanism that I mentioned earlier. So when receiving a cue, like entering the subway, a part of the memory is activated, and then because the neurons are interconnected, the activity pattern is attracted towards the pattern of the full event memory. Here, that the subway is usually dirty, so that the full event pattern is reinstated and a memory is retrieved. Then this memory-based prediction is projected to CA1. Encoding of novel sensory evidence, for example, that I walked into the subway and it was clean, is thought to reach CA1 from entorhinal cortex. Entorhinal cortex receives massive sensor information from more posterior brain regions, and is then believed to project this information to CA1. 
So in genomic prediction errors, shift the hippocampus towards encoding, um, towards upregulating encoding and downweighting retrieval, we expect that they would lead to increased connectivity between CA1 and internal cortex and decreased connectivity between CA1 and CA3. To test this hypothesis, participants extensively learned the layout and the furniture of rooms. Each room had a title and a corresponding image. In the scanner, we then queued participants on each trial to retrieve a room that they have learned, but then after a brief delay, show them an image that had changes. So here you see two changes, and we also had trials that had no changes at all. And overall in this study, we had zero to four changes. And this is our manipulation of prediction error. So more changes means more prediction error. We then looked at the image part of the trial when prediction errors occurred and measured functional connectivity, the extent to which two regions show correlated activity across trials. And we did it separately for each level of changes, zero to four. And before going to the data, just a quick reminder of our hypothesis. We predicted that CA1, CA3 connectivity will decrease with more prediction error, potentially reflecting a shift away from retrieval of erroneous memory-based predictions. By contrast, CA1 and toronto connectivity was, ex was expected to increase with more prediction error, maybe reflecting a bias of the hippocampus towards encoding of novel sensory evidence. So here you see changes in the room on the x-axis, functional connectivity on the y-axis, and as predicted, CA1, CA3 connectivity decreased with more changes or more prediction error. In contrast, but again, as predicted, CA1 and Toronto connectivity increased with more changes, and there was a significant interaction here. These results suggest that mnemonic prediction errors selectively bias hippocampal connectivity, potentially shifting the hippocampus towards encoding of sensory evidence and away from retrieval of incorrect memory-based predictions. And that bias towards encoding potentially facilitates memory update. So motivated by these results of increased CA1 and toronto connectivity, potentially reflecting increased processing of perceptual details, we ran a behavioral study to ask, do mnemonic prediction errors promote detailed memories? And to test that, we had participants learn predictions, and then we violated them and tested memory. During prediction learning, Participants uh, were presented with a sequence of objects. Each object appeared alone on the screen. And unbeknownst to the participants, we embedded in this sequence uh, pairs of objects that always follow each other. So that after some repetition, participants develop predictions that after the chair comes the bus and after the bench comes the beach ball. Then after prediction learning, we violated participants' predictions. We presented again the chair, eliciting predictions. But then instead of the bus, we presented novel objects. We validated participants' predictions of the bus by presenting this wheelbarrow. And the other half of the pairs remained intact. And we also presented um, novel objects that did not violate any predictions as baseline. We then tested participants' memory for the violation and the no violation items in a way that allowed us to gauge whether they remember details of the objects that they saw. We presented participants with identical old items, items that appeared exactly as they appeared during the violation phase, or with similar lures. Another exemplar of the same item that appeared during uh, the study. We asked participants to indicate whether an item was old, similar, or new. And of course, we also had some new items that participants did not see at all during the experiment. And the idea is that to be able to say old on an old item in this task, and not to be confused and say similar, participants need to remember the details, that they have seen exactly this wheelbarrow. And you see here that across two experiments, participants said more old for identical old items that violated prior predictions, and that is in orange, compared to items that did not violate prior predictions in purple. And participants did not get confused and said more similar for violations compared to no violation old items. And this specific memory advantage suggests that violations of prior predictions promote detailed memories. It is also consistent with the possibility that increased connectivity between CA1 and internal cortex that I've shown you in the previous study facilitates detailed memories by upregulating and coding of sensory information. So in this part of the talk, I focus on how we update our knowledge. And I talked about how we do so in the case of prediction error. 
And I found that prediction errors bias hippocampal connectivity, which might promote detailed memories. But there are also other types of updating. So for example, just adding a new piece of information to already existing knowledge. And when we learn that, for example, when we learn that uh, Beyonce has a new album, we just add this uh, new piece of information to all of our existing knowledge about Madonna. We know that prior knowledge facilitates memory for novel information. So for example, experts remember better information in their field of expertise, but it doesn't have to be in the domain. Prior knowledge also improves memory for arbitrary associations. So if I tell you that this is Madonna's new friend and the friend here is a novel unfamiliar person, but remember it better than if I tell you that these two unfamiliar ladies are, friend, are friends. So the overwhelming majority of these previous studies used or tested one trial episodic memory. But we know that many times we experience with information again and again and again. So when Beyonce has a new album, we hear about it over and over and over and over again. So how does prior knowledge influence the, the, the trajectory of learning across repetition? To ask that, we repeatedly expose participants to pairs of faces in two conditions. We, they either uh, learned a novel association between a famous face and a novel face, uh, and these are our prior knowledge pairs, or between two novel faces, so no prior knowledge. So there's always one novel face. The question is whether we attach it to another novel face or not. This is just an illustration in the actual study. The faces appeared sequentially to prevent participants from focusing on one face more than the other. Uh, and participants did some orthogonal task unrelated to prior knowledge, whether the two faces are of the same gender or not. And we can think of two different hypotheses for the trajectory of learning. So in the resources idea, we have seen Madonna many times before. We don't need to invest much in processing Madonna. So now if we learn that this is Madonna's new friend, we have plenty of available resources to encode this new person and the association between them. And this is what you see here in this pie chart. Madonna in blue doesn't take much. And so we have plenty of available uh, resources in gray to encode the novel association. When both faces are unfamiliar, we need to allocate more resources to each of them. So we end up having less for each and for linking them together. And the prediction of this hypothesis, let's say we're looking at reaction time as a measure of learning, so lower reaction times means better learning. Uh, in the resources hypothesis, learning about Madonna in blue should start better. We have seen her many times before, she is processed easily to begin with, but yet another repetition of Madonna doesn't really matter. Novel faces, on the other hand, in orange, may not start, um, may not be so good to begin with but they benefit much more from each additional presentation. Hence, they should exhibit increased learning. So in this hypothesis, prior knowledge benefits learning initially, repetitions benefit the two novel faces. The simulation hypothesis is a different one in nature. It relies on the idea that Madonna is represented as a network of nodes and links between them. And then new information can be assimilated into this network by changing a bit the links between these nodes. These adjustments of the links require some iteration for the network to stabilize and acquire the new memory. For example, through few iterations of propagation of error signals in the network. And when no prior knowledge exists, building such a network requires a lot of time. So in this hypothesis, both the blue and the orange line should start similar because in the beginning, no assimilation has yet happened. We need a few rounds for the network to settle and update the links in the network. But then better learning should be observed when we have some existing network to allow assimilation. So which one would it be? I'll now show you actual data. And you can see here that <clears throat> both lines start the same and the advantage of prior knowledge emerges over repetition. And it is sustained through learning. And this is consistent with the assimilation hypothesis. I also want to mention in the paper, we also tested whether this reduced reaction time reflects learning of the specific stimuli paired with Madonna, so the specific face, or if participants just learn better response, the better the response paired with Madonna. And we found evidence that it's learning of the stimuli, not only the response. So if you're interested in these questions of response versus stimuli learning, you can look into that, and I'm also happy to talk about it later. 
We also replicated the same finding in another experiment in which we used a different category of stimuli. So familiar versus unfamiliar logos, whether you attach an unfamiliar logo to a Twitter logo or whether it's just two novel logos. We also had a completely different task. We got the same results. So next we wanted to ask, what is it about prior knowledge that promotes learning? And we can think about two features of prior knowledge. So first, Madonna is highly familiar. It has an existing stable representation built over many previous experiences. And that stable representation can provide a scaffold for assimilating new information, like the new association of Madonna and her friend. Second, Madonna also has prior associations like other related people, a famous clip, or favorite song. So it could be that this rich network of prior association allows the new uh, friend to be weaved into this network. And when we rely on participants' existing knowledge, the familiarity of Madonna might be hard to tease apart from the prior associations, but we can do it when you train a neural network and see what, networks what network gives us the behavior that we get. Uh, so this is what we did. And I'm not going to go into details. I'm happy to talk about it later and it's in the paper, but the stable in the stable representation, we just exposed the network to Madonna a few times before teaching the new association. Uh, we didn't teach any additional information. And in the prior association, we actually taught the network a few association on Madonna before adding the new, uh, the novel association. And the error that you'll see here is the difference between the output of the network and the target. We didn't fit the data to participants' behavior. We were just wanted to know what gives us qualitatively the same pattern uh, as the behavior. And you can see here that the stable representation produced results that capture our data in the sense that there is no initial advantage. It emerges later, um, suggesting that prior knowledge benefits learning by allowing a stable representation into which new information can be assimilated. And when we look at the prior association model, you actually see here a very interesting behavior. So early in learning, you see interference. Prior knowledge is worse, the, the blue line is higher. And that actually might make sense because the prior associations of Madonna might interfere with learning the novel association. But still in behavior, we don't see it. And we also have evidence for a final memory test that I didn't show you in which prior knowledge enhances memory. That is also the robust finding in the literature, prior knowledge improves memory. So when we turn to study the neural mechanisms, we first asked, could it be that prior knowledge promote processes that alleviate interference? And one candidate process is hippocampal pattern separation that I mentioned earlier. So just to remind you briefly, Pattern separation is the notion that inputs that are coming into the hippocampus are allocated with distinct representations. And this process was suggested to mitigate interference. So could it be that prior knowledge promotes hippocampal separation? Our second question regarded um, assimilation, which is suggested to occur in the cortex. New information should be integrated into prior cortical knowledge structure um, that were well learned and consolidated. So we asked if we can find neural evidence for this notion of cortical assimilation. We did exactly the same study as before, only that before and after learning, we measured the neural representation of each face. And we could compute the similarity between faces before and after learning and see how it changed. So if indeed prior knowledge promotes separation processes in the hippocampus, we would predict that items in prior knowledge pairs should become less similar to one another or more separated in their neural representations through learning. So here on the y-axis, you're gonna see differences in similarity. Negative values means the item became separated, positive means they became similar. And when looking at the left anterior hippocampus, prior knowledge pairs um, indeed became more separated. For novel pairs, however, we got similarity. And this similarity is a replication of a previous finding that used novel stimuli. And it is, and it is specific to pairs that participants remembered later uh, in a memory test that we did. In both prior knowledge and no prior knowledge, pair, prior knowledge pairs, changes only occur for remembered pairs. Nothing happens in the forgotten ones and the interaction is of course significant. So these results suggest that in the hippocampus, 
Madonna and her friend became separated while the two novel friends became similar. Now, what about the cortex? I already mentioned the idea that when prior knowledge exists, new information is assimilated into a cortical representation. However, exactly how this assimilation happens at the level of the neural representation remain unknown. So we propose that in the cortex, learning is asymmetric. If, information, uh, if new information is weaved into an existing representation, we propose that this new information is largely altered through learning, but the prior knowledge doesn't change much. So Madonna stays Madonna, and her new friend is the one that changes the representation to become similar. But do we have a way of looking at these changes in the brain? And the answer is yes. So we're going to use the same neural representations from before, um, from before and after learning, but use them differently. And for ease of speech, I'm just going to turn the first phase, Madonna here in the A phase, and the second one, the B phase. We compared similarity, the person correlation, across pre and post. So first, we computed the similarity of the B item after learning to A before learning, and this gives us a measure of how much uh, B moved towards A. Then we compute A after learning to B before learning, and this gives us a measure of how much A moved towards B, or how much A became more similar to B. Then we simply subtract the latter from the former to get an asymmetry measure of how much B became more similar to A, more so than A became more similar to B. I'm going to show you results from the left VLPFC, ventral lateral prefrontal cortex. This is a region that was functionally connected to the anterior hippocampus during learning of the pairs. And if indeed learning was asymmetric, such that the friend moved towards Madonna more so than vice versa, we would expect that our asymmetry measure would be positive for prior knowledge pairs. And indeed, this is what we get. So here on the y-axis, you see the asymmetry index. Positive values means that B moved towards A more than A moved towards B. And I remind you it's a subtraction, so zero here would mean that the association is symmetric. And in prior knowledge pairs in blue, indeed you see positive, uh, a positive value, significantly different from zero. And it was also specific to pairs that were learned together in the study. So the gray bar here is shuffled faces. This is the same asymmetry measure, but we shuffled the faces, this time taking Madonna with other novel faces that appeared with other famous faces. So you can see here that it's not some general effect of just having a face appearing in the study with another famous face. It is specific to faces that were paired together during learning. So this result suggests that the representation of the friend moved towards Madonna. And when there was no prior knowledge, there is no difference from zero or from shuffled, suggesting that the association is symmetric. Okay, so in this study, we found evidence that as we update our knowledge, the VLPFC might assimilate new information into existing knowledge structures, while the hippocampus separates these representations, presumably to mitigate interference. So to sum up today, I ask two big questions. How do we learn an organized, an organized representation of the repeated structure of the world? And how do we update this knowledge? And in the first part, I've shown you mechanisms for how learning shapes context representations, integrating and separating representations at different levels, both when the context is fully observed, but also when some information we need to guide our decisions is unobserved. But to be adaptive, a learning system also needs to know how to update this knowledge. And I've shown you that uh, how that happens in the case of prediction errors by biasing connectivity along hippocampal pathways and promoting detailed memories. And then in the last part, I ask about just adding a new piece of information to existing knowledge and saw um, in behavior, some modeling work, as well as in the brain, that prior knowledge promotes assimilation of new information into existing knowledge structures, while also promoting separation processes that might alleviate interference. So going back to the starting point, I mentioned that behavior is an interaction between the external environment and our internal knowledge. Knowledge about the structure of the world, our semantics, and this knowledge allows us to make predictions and guide our decisions and facilitate further learning. 
And I think that the studies that I presented today show ways in which this interaction is organized or that our brain has very specific ways to keep things in order. By biasing different systems and having different representations, answering different aspects of this com complex interaction to facilitate learning, memory, and decision-making. And in my current and future work, I'm planning to extend this work to address hierarchical knowledge organization and to ask how this organized uh, interaction fails in the case of mental illnesses. And I'm happy to talk about it in the discussion. So with that, I wanna thank my wonderful advisors. Uh, this work was done in their labs, Yael Niv, Leila Davachi, and Anat Maril, and all the collaborators on the different projects. It, it takes a village. Uh, I also want to thank their NIV lab for their support. And I want to thank you all for your time and for listening. And I'm happy to take questions. All right. Um, Erica, how do you want to do the questions? Um, um I, yeah, I can read the questions to you oh, and yeah. you can, uh, you can answer them. And I see that people are posting questions into the chat. Please post them to the Q and A so that we can, you know, separate the questions and like all the, you know, congratulations for such a wonderful talk. <laughs> all right. Um, so Jesse Gomez asked a question, um, about your last study. So here's what they say. Where um, in the last finding where you show VLPFC may engage in assimilation, is it possible that when viewing Madonna, Madonna, we don't need to engage our attention as much since our recognition is pretty immediate, but for the rapid B phase, uh, for the paired B phase, we may initially have to engage our attention more to examine the phase and then less to uh, less so as we learn it. Um, in this case, then uh, in this case, then our decreasing engagement of attention will make the VLPFC pattern of be more like Madonna over time, which wouldn't be assimilation, but just a change in attention. Yeah, that is really interesting. Um, so what I'm thinking is that um, I have a few thoughts. So first of all, I think this we still need an idea of why this like a decreased attention would create this specific mechanism of or this, this specific direction of asymmetry, um, which I don't think is necessarily um, there. Like I don't know how that would happen. And also attention, like if there's less attention, I would assume that memory would be worse. Like all the behavioral measures that prior knowledge enhances. Um, should, uh, I guess, also are, are not so consistent with like less attention. Um, the other thing that I was thinking is that I think this like attention mechanism might not be specific to pairs that were linked together. So like all of the faces that appeared with famous faces should um, show this mechanism. But what we see in this study is that the asymmetry is specific to to learn um, to 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 pairs of faces that were learned together. So I think the specificity of this finding, the direction of the asymmetry, as well as the fact that it's only related to um, pairs that were studied together, along with the the behavioral findings that I showed, that actually kind of pitted together predictions of the attention or resources hypothesis. Um, and the simulation hypothesis. I think that all of these evidence, uh, pieces of evidence together may suggest that um, it's not attention in this case, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm I, I will consider, I will think about more potential mechanisms by which attention can lead these specific results and, and I'll, I'll think about it and get back to you. So thank you for this question. Great, um, so the next question comes from Pao Xue Fan. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. So they said, hi, really cool work. I have a question for the celebrity face study. If you already learn one face during experiment, can it later serve as the purpose 
of celebrity face, or do we need rich representation that we have learned over a larger time scale in real life? Yeah, awesome question. I love this question. I don't know. Uh, it's a really wonderful question. What makes what makes prior knowledge prior knowledge? You know, um, we didn't test that. It's a great idea for for further test, uh, a further experiment. The little bit of knowledge that I have is from um, the neural network model that we did, in which we saw that like it is it potentially is the stable representation. Um, but I don't know if that's what. First of all, I don't know if that's real, and I also don't know if um, that what underlies the neural effect that we saw. Um, so that's a very long way of saying I don't know, and we should study that. And it's a wonderful question. Great. Um, so the next uh, next question comes from Katie. So she asks, how do you think this would play out for a non symbols of a non concept? So, for example, I know Madonna's name and songs, but didn't know that's what her face looked like. So I would still need to learn that association. Do you think the learning would still be as asymmetric as in that case? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Again, I think it taps into the same kind of question of like, what is it about prior knowledge that, that bring these effects? And is it the fact that Madonna is nameable or not? Um, I can say it's not only faces because we also, like the, the, the behavioral effects are there regardless of like the type of stimuli, et cetera. Um, but regarding the neural effects, we really don't know. We just, we did this study in order to see what like, what even do we get these effects at all? Um, and, and we did, and now that we did, I think we can start and answer all of these super interesting questions about like, you know, is it the fact that Madonna is nameable? Is it like the association? That, do we need consolidation to get these effects? There are all kind of like wonderful questions that um, we can ask. And yeah, we just need to do it. Okay. So this question is getting a lot of upvotes, so I'm just going to read it first. So this right. is from Ziv Van Zion. So it's a question about how did you examine hippocampal subfields using fMRI? What kind of scanner or pre-processing pre -processing steps or perhaps sequences are involved? Yeah. Um, so we used a um, three Tesla scanner, a high resolution. Um, which allow high resolution of 1.5 by 1.5 by like two millimeter sli uh, slice thickness. So that allowed us to have the resolution um, in the ball data, uh, but we also used um, anatomical, uh, higher resolution anatomical images. And we I used free surfer um, anatomical segmentation in order to get these subregions. And then I registered them to the API and yeah. Cool. And I recommend people take a look at the paper since a lot of details probably can be covered. Yeah, I hope it will be out soon. That sadly is not there yet, but it will be. Yep. Um, okay. And the next question comes from Clara Sava Siegel. Um, Hi, awesome talk. You briefly mentioned it on the last slide, but which type of mental illness would you expect this mechanism specifically in the celebrity face study to fall apart in? When? Yeah. Um, thank you. So the celebrity um, study uh, with the prior knowledge is actually not something that I currently address with um, mental illnesses. What we are currently looking at is um, at event segmentation. So more related to the first study that I showed, um, I kind of continue that work um, addressing impairments in event segmentation in mental disorders, first we're gonna look at it just behaviorally and the mental disorders or mental illnesses that we're gonna look at are um, using, initially using uh, online subclinical population and measures of self-report. Uh, we're gonna look at anxiety, depression, and uh, potentially OCD and ADHD um, to see how um, these type of mental illnesses might, might be correlated with uh, impairments in event segmentation. Okay, great. One last question. Um, this is from um, Stem Medi Leopis. I'm sorry if I mispronounced anyone's name. Um, so they said, awesome talk. Thanks so much. I may have missed this, but could you explain the reasoning for subtracting repetition one from the other repetitions again in the first experiment you described? Was it the similarity values 
or the pattern representations that were subtracted from one another? Yeah, so we subtracted the similarity values, uh, not the, the patterns themselves. Um, and uh, the reason for doing it is that when we, whenever we compute this similarity um, in uh, fMRI, there are all kinds of autocorrelations that we see that are not related to our experiment. They're just related to the nature of the bold signal. Um, and so to account for that here, because in this study, what we really cared about was how things change with learning, the way we approached it was to um, subtract the first repetition. Okay, hey, great. With that, we're gonna conclude the session and um, we just posted the link to the Q&A. So for people who have any further questions, either about the science or about Oded, um, please move to the other room. And thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.